Dr. Robert Selig, in today's video, I'd like to discuss the significance of a potassium deficiency. Because what I see when I'm doing serial hair tissue analysis, mineral balancing, and from all the colleagues and peers that I talk to, one of the most prevalent pressing issues is a potassium deficiency. So a potassium deficiency can have huge implications regarding our health. So we must address the underlying causes of a potassium deficiency. So if you have a potassium deficiency in a skeletal muscle, that may be your twitches, your cramps, your spasms, your contractures. If that potassium deficiency happens to be in a heart cell, that will lead to the arrhythmias and eventually to the more pernicious cardiovascular diseases, potentially ending in a fatal heart attack. So we also know that sodium and potassium regulate the whole water balance of the body. We know that potassium is highly important in glucose metabolism, but most important is sodium and potassium set the electrical grid causing the how the cell membrane permeability to allow things in and to allow things out to stimulate action. So the action potential is how we get things moving. The action potential is the flooding in of sodium during the depolarization phase and the exit of potassium during the repolarization phase. So that's the action potential, but we must reset that grid. To reset that grid, we must understand about the sodium potassium AT paces. Those are the sodium potassium pumps that will move the potassium back into the cell where it belongs and kick the sodium out of the cell where it belongs. And so when we have that action potential, remember that action potential is responsible for any time we think, blink, react, secrete, do anything, anytime we move, feel, interpret, sense anything, it's because of an action potential. And that action potential is regulated through the movement of the ions, more specifically sodium and potassium. And so that sodium potassium, that action potential will eventually stimulate the voltage gated calcium channels once we hit positive 30 the volt the energy once we hit positive 30 that will open up the voltage gated calcium channels allowing calcium to flood in and calcium is the impetus that's going to move the vesicle that contains the neurotransmitter to move it to the cleft so the neurotransmitter can be released now that neurotransmitter neurotrans may be inhibitory or stimulatory. If it's glutamate, it's gonna be uh, stimulatory. If it's GABA, it's gonna be inhibitory. And that will have an effect on either the end organ or it'll have an effect on another neuron to either excite it or inhibit it to either excite the end organ or inhibit it. And so it could be any neurotransmitter. It could be dopamine, adrenaline, um, any neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. So all the neurotransmitters are the impetus for releasing it is the action potential that opens up the voltage-gated calcium channels. And those voltage-gated calcium channels, it's calcium that causes the neurotransmitter to be released. Now, the key is we got to get the calcium out of the cell and we got to get the sodium back out of the cell. To get the sodium out of the cell, to get the potassium back into the cell, this is where we must understand the sodium potassium pumps. These are your AT paces, your NAK pumps are the most integral part of understanding how we can regulate these ions for the balance of sodium and potassium. And so the importance of these pumps, so we know that physiologists, the top physiologists in the world are telling us that one third to 50% of all the energy your body generates, so one third to one half of all the energy your body generates, goes to running these pumps. So these pumps, anytime that we understand energy in the body and we know that the, the AT paces, the sodium potassium pumps, 
one third to 50% of all your energy goes to running these pumps. So that must tell you how important these pumps are. And so we as practitioners, when we're doing mineral balancing and we're analyzing hair analysis, we have to understand that the bulk of these ions are used for running these pumps. So that's like you know, again, depending on which physiologist you're talking to or reading about, you know, we're not going to split hairs and say, is it one third or 50%? The bottom line is a lot of energy goes to running these pumps. That really is the take home message. Now, what we have to understand is whenever you see ATP, ATP must have a magnesium ion bound to it or these pumps don't work. So the magnesium, remember we always say that minerals are the spark plugs of life. This is the prime example of the spark of life because we have to break the bond to release the phosphate, to release the energy to run these pumps. Magnesium is the spark that's going to break the bond to release the energy, churning the adenosine triphosphate to a diphosphate. But in the releasing of, of the breaking of the bond, the releasing of the phosphate is the energy needed to move the potassium back into the cell and to kick the sodium out of the cell. But understanding that without the spark of life, without magnesium, we can't run these pumps. And these pumps in a magnesium deficient state, so when we have low levels of magnesium in a deficient state, then these pumps will become affected. We won't be able to, to move the ions back, the potassium back into the cell and move the sodium out of the cell. So in a magnesium deficient state, these pumps will be less active, meaning it's gonna cause potassium deficiency inside the cell, and that's what we call a potassium deficiency, and that's a refractory potassium deficiency. So as a result of a magnesium deficiency, we're causing a refractory potassium deficiency. So now the inside of the cell has a magnesium deficiency and a potassium deficiency. So anytime that we have a magnesium and potassium deficiency, that will cause a sodium and calcium overload. So a sodium and calcium overload is the death of a cell. We know that sodium is going to pull water. Wherever sodium goes, water goes. So when the sodium is in the cell, that's gonna cause the cell to swell, edema, and if we can't get that sodium out, eventually the sodium will cause the cell to burst, the death of the cell. The calcium will cause the great calcification. Calcium is Saturn, that is Saturn's return, the great undertaker, Saturn is father time. Father time will get us all in the end, but part of mineral balancing is slowing down father time. To do that, we must modulate calcium to prevent it from precipitating out of solution and depositing to every organ, gland, and tissue. If that calcium can't be pumped out of the heart cell, then we're gonna have that calcium calcifying the blood supply that feeds the heart, causing the calcium uh, to calcify the muscles that open up the valves, causing the calcium to uh, block and calcify the, the electrical energy of the heart that dictates the rhythm. So this is the importance of understanding how we must get the calcium and the sodium out of the cell because the sodium and calcium overload is the death of a cell. And so in a magnesium deficient state will cause a refractory potassium deficient state which will cause a sodium and calcium overload and over time that is the death of the cell. So the whole thing in mineral balancing is preventing premature aging and that's why to modulate the calcium we must understand the relationship of sodium and potassium and how magnesium is the quarterback that runs the show. So think of the Tom Brady's winning six, seven Super Bowls, the Fran Tarkentons, the Joe Montanas, you know. So to have a great team, you gotta have a great quarterback. 
So the quarterback is running the show. Doesn't mean that the other players, the the running backs and the the wide receivers and the defensive players, they're all important, but the quarterback really is dictating are we going to win the gold. So when you have a good magnesium status, you're going to be able to run these pumps, you're going to be able to kick out the sodium, kick out the calcium, get that potassium back into the cell so we have a good homeostasis of these electrolytes. So what's interesting about these electrolytes is that when we do a blood test, a blood test will never tell you about a potassium or magnesium deficiency because 99% of these ions are intracellular. So we know that 50% of the magnesium is in the bones because the bones are so metabolically active. You know, the osteoblastic activity, the osteoclastic activity for bone remodeling and regeneration. So the bones are highly metabolically active, but we also have the bone marrow to make your blood cells, your red blood cells and your immune white blood cells. So the bones, 50% of that magnesium is in the bones. And so if we don't fix, if women don't fix their adrenals by the time they hit menopause, that's when they go into severe bone loss. So around menopause, the estrogen and progesterone from the ovaries shuts down. So who picks up the slack? The adrenals. The adrenals will still make your estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, you know, and all your aldosterone and cortisol. So very important how the adrenals are helping to regulate these ions. So in a menopausal state, if we haven't fixed the adrenal burnout, when the ovaries shut down, now we're asking the adrenals to do double the work when they're already in burnout, and that's why women go into severe bone loss during menopause. And that bone loss isn't just the osteoporosis, the osteopenias, and the degenerative bone diseases. It's also your red blood cells, your anemias, and your white blood cells, your immune system. So, 25% of the magnesium is in the muscles, and that could be the skeletal muscles, the cardiac muscles, the smooth muscles. So in the smooth muscle, if that magnesium isn't there, we can't dilate the... Uh, the vessels to move the blood and they will calcify and that will cause the calcification of these arteries and that will cause the hypertension. And so understanding how important this quarterback is, how the most important ion is to running the show. So 50% of the magnesium is in the bones, 25% of it is in the muscles, skeletal, smooth, uh, cardiac muscle. And then the other 24% is in the other organs, glands, and tissues, the liver, the kidneys, the adrenals. And then the 1% is in the blood. And that 1% in the blood, you know, if, if we're not, if we're just depending on blood testing to tell us the status of the electrolytes, we're in trouble. You know, so when you go to your doctor and they do the electrolytes and they, you know, the doctor says, oh, they're, you bo- they're euboxic. Euboxic means they all come back within normal limits. And so that's fine and dandy, but it's not really telling you about your magnesium status and your potassium status and your sodium and your chloride and your bicarbonate. Um, It's really missing the boat. And so if we just depend on the blood test, you know, that blood test will never really tell you the health trend of the body. And so that's why we really want to understand hair analysis in evaluating the nutrient minerals. Now, When we're talking about magnesium and how magnesium is going to correct the potassium deficiency, because at least 50% of your potassium deficiency is due to a magnesium deficiency. There are other causes of a potassium deficiency, but I'm not going to get into that today. I just want to highlight that most of the time, if we don't fix this refractory potassium deficiency by addressing the magnesium deficiency, we don't move the needle and raise the potassium levels. Because what do we see on hair analysis? Potassium at one, potassium at two, potassium at three. 
those when you see the potassium below five or less that's your adrenal burnout patterns those are your sympathetic dominant patterns those are your victim patterns so we know how important this potassium is but again the underlying message is we must address this magnesium deficiency to fix the potassium deficiency because like i said at least 50% of your potassium deficiency is due to a magnesium deficiency. Now that brings me to the next topic, which is to understand the magnesium deficiency, you must understand the enemies of magnesium. The first enemy of magnesium is the MPK soils. So first, the, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium fertilized soils they don't have magnesium, so we're growing our food in magnesium deficient soils, zinc deficient, selenium deficient, uh, iodine deficient soils, so we know how deficient these soils are. Then, to make matters worse, the chemical fertilizers, the glyphosates, are one of the worst chelators of magnesium. So the insecticides, the herbicides, the fungicides all chelate magnesium out. So these chemical fertilizers are destroying the living soils, making our soils depleted and dead. And so we're destroying the microbes that are activating these minerals. And so we better have an understanding of how we're going to repair the soils because with the death of the soil is the death of the planet and we you know and the living soils that are the most precious thing the earth element we're destroying it with all these chemical synthetic things so the agents the enemy agents of magnesium are the mpk soils the glyphosates and fluoride is one of the worst chelators of magnesium. So we've had the water fluoridation and then we're watering our crops with the fluoride in the water, causing more magnesium to be chelated out of the already deficient soils of magnesium. And then another big issue is stomach acid. So without stomach acid, you can't put the magnesium into the right valence so it can be absorbed. Stomach acid is responsible for putting the, the right valence of magnesium, of calcium, and iron, and other metals. And it's also responsible, you need that stomach acid so you can absorb your B vitamins. So without stomach acid, we're not going to absorb magnesium intelligently and so how do I know if you have low stomach acid if you have low zinc low phosphorus low sodium low potassium on a hair analysis you can bet the house you are not making sufficient stomach acid so low stomach acid is another enemy of magnesium uh, also, diuretics, you know, the, the diuretics that the doctors give you to control your blood pressure, you know, so when you have high blood pressure, hypertension, you know, you have a high blood volume, so they want you to, you know, uh, to get your kidneys to start dumping the water. So through the urine, we're going to release, um, we're going to release the pressure, uh, the blood volume to decrease the blood pressure. But the diuretics are going to leach out your magnesium and your potassium. And this is happening in the glomeruli of the kidneys. And the glomeruli decide whether we're going to reabsorb the magnesium and the potassium or we're going to be pissing out the ions. But the diuretics are blocking some of these channels that cause the the wasting of magnesium and the wasting of potassium as we piss out our magnesium and potassium, all to regulate and modulate the blood pressure. But at the end of the day, when we become magnesium potassium deficient, that will cause a short circuit somewhere in the body that will have a fatal reaction. So this is why there is no short term fix to correcting our mineral deficiencies and our heavy metal toxicities. So another enemy of magnesium are the metals, the toxic metals, lead absolutely will block magnesium. Cadmium, one of the most notorious chelators and blockers of magnesium. So during the MPK soils, they're, they're moving the cadmium into these soils 
and that cadmium will block the magnesium like no tomorrow. So the enemies of magnesium are the soils, are the glyphosates, are the fluorides, are the, um, the heavy metals, and the worst offender of magnesium happens to be copper. So in a copper overload state, that will block magnesium in the mitochondria. And that's an interesting phenomena, and we're gonna take a look at how that happens. We know that when we're generating energy through the mitochondrial energy pathways, we start with the glucose, and that glucose is gonna go through glycolysis, and then it's gonna go into the Krebs cycle, and then it's gonna enter the electron transport chain. What we see in this picture is the electron transport chain that will take the electrons from the Krebs cycle and move these electrons through these iron sulfur, uh, iron sulfur clusters embedded into the, to these complex one, two, and three. And so we're moving the electrons to its end game is copper. So copper guarantees the delivery of the electrons to oxygen. So this is how important copper is because copper will donate the electrons, uh, copper will donate the electrons to oxygen, taking that oxygen, making it molecular oxygen, and this molecular oxygen will allow the magnesium to bind to the ATP. So the magnesium can ignite the ATP to break the bond, to release the energy. Uh, and in doing so, we have the energy now to run the pumps. So what happens with copper, because copper is the most electrical nutrient mineral in the body. Silver is the most conductive of all the elements. Copper is number two. We don't use uh, silver because, you know, uh, silver is not a nutrient mineral, but copper is because copper has a love affair with oxygen because it can deliver the electrons to oxygen to make the oxygen do its thing so it can uh, allow the magnesium to bind to the ATP. But in a copper overload state, we're gonna see that this excess copper, due to the proximity of copper in the complex four, going into the complex five, its proximity is very, very close. And due to the conductivity of copper, so the conductivity of copper, and due to the proximity conductivity of copper, because it is the most highly electrical nutrient mineral. So it's electrical. And copper copper is the harlot of the metals. It always wants to hook up. So in a copper overload state, it's gonna wanna hook up and it's going to bully out the magnesium. Because remember, magnesium is in that plus two state. So copper in its plus two state in the mitochondria will bully out the magnesium and it will block the magnesium Hence, it will block the magnesium so the ATP can't ignite, we can't release the energy. And so the number one symptom of a copper overload, the very first number one symptom is fatigue because we can't generate the energy. When we have fatigue in the energy because the mitochondrial energy pathways are are being compromised, that will set the table for every chronic disease known to mankind. And so that depends on your genetic weaknesses where the deficit will be. But if that mitochondrial energy pathways are compromised due to a copper overload, we can't create the energy, the juice. The juice runs everything. So this is why we want to understand the enemies of magnesium, which are plentiful. And of course, this list is not exhaustive by any means. So there are many enemies of magnesium and stresses being the number one. You know, think of all the emotional stresses, the traumas and dramas of the day, the chemical stresses, the metal stresses. So all the stresses deplete your magnesium. You know, the diuretics that we're drinking, you know, the teas, the caffeines, the alcohol, all deplete your magnesium. So to understand magnesium, you have to understand the anti-nutrient concept. And this is very simple. So if you have in a bank account 
$100. Uh, you don't know the true status of the $100 if you don't know your expenses and your debt. So you may have, you may owe money here, you may owe money here. And so that will tell you the true status of what you're worth. So it may not be, so when you add up all your debt, you know, you may have $101 in debt and only $100 in the bank. So you're negative. So your energy currency is going to be in the deficit. So this is why we must understand the enemies of magnesium. So to, to move the needle of potassium, to raise the potassium, to get us out of adrenal burnout patterns and sympathetic dominant patterns, we must understand how important this magnesium is. So that means to address the magnesium deficiency to eventually get to the potassium deficiency, we must understand how to detox the glyphosates, the metals, the copper out of the body. So this is why in mineral balancing and detoxification, we have to understand the importance of detoxification. And even when we're detoxing copper, that can cause a pseudo inversion. So Whenever we have a copper dump or a lead dump or an aluminum dump, that will cause magnesium potassium to be pissed out into the, you know, into the blood, eventually through the kidneys, into the urine. And so that will be a pseudo inversion. So we have to under, understand the difference between a inversion, an NAK inversion, and a pseudo NAK inversion. Because dumping metals is the key to getting healthy, but during a dump, it will upset the system. So that's where we may get an aggravation or a symptom where we take one step back to eventually go two steps forward. So this is the importance of understanding how the ATP magnesium, so every medical biochemical textbook should have it written ATP with magnesium bound to it. Because again, if the magnesium isn't bound to the uh, adenosine triphosphate, we won't be able to release the energy, you know, to break the bond to release the energy. So the sodium potassium pumps are the key. And so to get the to get the two potassiums back into the cell to kick the sodium out of the cell, we must have this ATP magnesium. Now we also have uh, calcium. Let's say calcium is in a skeletal muscle because you need the calcium to cause the contraction of a muscle. That's absolutely pertinent for a muscle to contract. But you can't keep the calcium in the cell or you get the contracture, contracture, and eventually that will be the death of you if you can't get the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the storage tubules for calcium. But getting that calcium back in requires two potassiums and a magnesium. And this is where we see the sodium potassium pumps are keeping this gradient going to make sure that we have the energy to run the calcium pump, making sure that we have the energy to run the sodium calcium exchanger. So this is another way of removing calcium from the sun from the cell is through the sodium calcium exchangers where this is an antiport system, meaning that something's going to go this way, something's going to go that way. In this instance, uh, calcium is going to go out of the cell, sodium is going to go inside the cell. So we have to keep this sodium equilibrium, and to do that, this is where we have these sodium potassium pumps to make sure that the sodium calcium exchanger can do its job, but for this for three sodiums to remove one calcium, we must understand, again, the sodium potassium pumps that regulate these calcium pumps and the sodium calcium exchanger. Because like we said, a sodium calcium overload is the death of the cell. So we covered a lot of information on this uh, quick review of sodium potassium a potassium deficiency a magnesium deficiency and remember the bulk of these ions are going through these action potentials so this is why we have to have a deeper understanding of these ions so we can move the needle 
to take our health, to exalt our health to a better place. And it takes time. There are no quick fixes. It takes time. It takes the detox. It takes the understanding of the nutrients. And it takes serial hair tissue analysis to decide on how we're prescribing our nutrients based on the sodium potassium ratio, based on the calcium magnesium ratio. So I'm going to end it here. And if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, leave a comment on the video. And I promise I will get back to you. And once again, thank you for taking the time for watching my video. And have a great day. Thank you.